Dario Argento's Tenebrae was released in 1982 and remains the director's most complex and controversial film to date. Argento's films are all marked by an experimental use of soundtrack, lighting and camera work and Tenebrae is no exception to this. However, any artistic labels that might be applied to these images are complicated by the director's insistence on using them as backdrop to scenes of extreme sexual violence. Tenebrae focuses on a detective fiction author named Peter Neal, who finds that his latest novel, entitled Tenebrae, is being used by a madman intent on eliminating human perversion, when in fact all of his victims are indeed beautiful women. As the murderer's actions merely repeat patterns contained in the novel, it adds weight to existing perceptions that Neil's work is both violent and misogynistic. This view is confirmed when a critic of Neil's work is slain in the film's most audacious and brilliantly staged murder sequence. <laughs> Although his close connections to the killings makes Neil a key suspect, he is initially discounted when his own life is threatened. As the bodies mount, a number of potential suspects emerge for the police investigation, which is headed by Inspector Giamani of the Rome Homicide Squad. Police believe that they have found a potential suspect in the figure of conservative television critic Cristiano Berti. However, when the character is murdered, the police investigation is once again thrown into confusion. Giamani finally realises that Bertie was indeed the razor killer, but he was dispatched by Neil when the author has decided to make the deadly leap from narrating crime to enacting it. Yes, it was me. I killed him. With its focus on a crime writer whose works trigger real-life violence, Tenebrae works more as a self-reflexive commentary on detective fiction rather than a straight splatter movie. This is because, although controversially defined as a horror director, the majority of Argento's works are actually part of the giallo tradition of detective fiction that was popular in Italy after the Second World War. You know something? I read all of those books. Agatha Christie, Mickey Spillane, Rex Stout, Egbert Payne. And I'm a detective, right? And you never guess who the murderer is? Right, never. Although initially a literary genre, the giallo became synonymous with a series of 70s films outlining the fate of amateur detectives who find themselves compromised by their involvement in violent or sexual crimes. Maitland McDonough has defined Tenebrae as the giallo to end all giallo, by which she means a thriller which takes as its very subject matter the traits and traditions on which the giallo format is based. This is clearly seen throughout the film, which is dominated by Peter Neal's attempts to solve very real crimes by casting allusions to the methods of fictional deduction offered by writers such as Conan Doyle. You know, there's a sentence in a Conan Doyle book. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. The boundaries of murder investigation and literary detection are further eroded, when Inspector Giamani abandons normal criminal procedure in order to plot a solution using Neil's fictional methods. Much to the dismay of critics, Tenebrae's constant references to writers such as Conan Doyle fail to give the film the tightly plotted modes of deduction that such references imply. What disturbed reviewers was Tenebrae's inability to limit or define culpability to any one individual in the film. Indeed, with its endless shifting of Peter Neal between the various positions of suspect, victim and murderer, Tenebrae offers an example of what Franco Moretti has defined as the nightmare of detective fiction. Namely, this is the featureless, de-individualised crime that anyone could have done because at this point everyone is the same. Although the film reveals Neal's psychotic status, its final scenes fail to fully isolate him as the only remaining killer at large. In so doing, the film also complicates the role of the detective as the agent traditionally responsible for bringing order to such narratives. Writing in the book The Dune Detective, Stefano Tani has argued that the positions of giallo detective and classical English investigators such as Sherlock Holmes are essentially incompatible. This reflects the fact that detective fiction was essentially a late import to Italy. 
Although the printing of the collection Elibra Jali in 1929 established an interest in the principles of British detection, it also produced a format based on parody and hybridity in the Italian writers who emulated its form. Mm -hmm. The Hound of the Baskervilles. Yes. The subversion of the rational tendencies of the classical English detective, often for comical effect, indicates the essential foreignness of the genre and it's seen with a literal importing of Argento's amateur detectives. Characteristically, these are English or American writers or musicians who arrive in Rome after having experienced some form of alienation, only to find themselves violently at odds with their new environment. Although these characters attempt to model themselves on detectives such as Holmes, they essentially lack the moral separation required to bring an orderly resolution to the crimes that they are involved in. Rather, this style of detection centres on the figure of the paranoid, alienated seeker that Todd French has identified as the typical Argento investigator. Their position marks a form of moral involvement, either through a direct link to the crime, as in the case of Peter Neal, or by inadvertently witnessing a crime and subsequently adopting the role of detective in order to satisfy certain intellectual vanities. This latter position was initiated by Sam Dalmas in Argento's first film, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. While walking past the gallery one night, Dalmas witnesses a violent assault against a woman, enacted by an unidentified aggressor. Becoming trapped in the glass doors at the front of the gallery, Dalmas is discovered by the police, who initially believe he is responsible for a series of sexual killings occurring in the city. As a result, Dalmas is forced to adopt the role of detective in order to clear his name. Although it is possible for the methods and actions of classical English detection to be present in an Argento film, they must always exist at its margins, beyond the spheres of sexuality and death that these films detail. In The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, this role is fulfilled by Inspector Morosini, who first views Dalmas as a suspect before exploiting his status as future victim in order to trap a killer. In the film, Morosini confirms his affinity with classical detectives such as Holmes, both by an inoculating absence from the sites of violent crimes, as well as through a constant and criminological attempt to categorise sexual deviation. Crucially, what separates this detective from Inspector Giamani of Tenebrae is the erosion of a critical distance separating Lawman from Peter Neal's unresolved crimes. According to Maitland McDonough, Tenebrae is a film dominated by doubles where all the characters, including Giamani, become wedded to Peter Neal's dormant psychosis. This curious connection between killer and lawman is indicated in the film's closing scene. Here, Argento frames Neal behind the policeman in a startling shot, and this seems to suggest that the two characters share the same body and even the same skin. While Argento's manipulation of detective fiction techniques did outrage many critics, it was Tenebrae's treatment of women that ensured it a video nasty status during the 1980s. In his visualisation of the Razor Killers campaign, Argento is here responsible for some of the most shocking cinematic murders of the decade. The film begins with the murder of a female shoplifter who is choked to death on the very pages of Tenebrae she was stolen from a department store. As the film unwinds, the murder sequences become more elaborate and the female suffering more fetishised. For instance, one victim has to ensure a prolonged attack from a dog before she is chased and mutilated by Bertie in the grounds of his own home. Is anybody here? Please? For critics of Argento's work, such scenes indicated an unparalleled sadism towards women. While the uncompromising nature of these scenes ensured their notoriety, Tenebrae is as famous for the excessive way in which these scenes are filmed. In particular, Tenebrae highlights Argento's landmark feature of disorientating camera work, and this culminates in a two and a half minute tracking shot over the roof of one future victim's house. In his pioneering work on the director, British critic Alan Jones has argued that Argento is in fact an art horror filmmaker who uses experimental film styles to complicate our relationship with the mayhem he produces. 
Although this view has often been ignored by the critics of Tenebrae, it is indeed possible to see the film as offering a critical commentary on sexual violence, rather than just condoning the brutal treatment of women. By filming the deaths of Bertie's victims in such a flashy, knowing manner, Argento ensures that victims frequently gaze directly into the camera lens, as if in criticism of those viewers enjoying their suffering. The idea that Argento was using Tenebrae to manipulate male fantasies of power and control is confirmed by one of the film's most controversial scenes. In this sequence, a young semi-naked woman strips before a group of assembled men and then is beaten by one of her lovers. Although this scene has been read as further evidence of the film's violence towards women, the actress in the sequence was in fact a transsexual actor. His inclusion in the movie indicates Argento's ability to manipulate the views of his outraged critics and ensures that Tenebrae remains his most sophisticated and startling film to date. <laughs>